Hi, I'm Mason Vale from Boise State University, and this video will explain the basics of exceptions and exception handling in Java. You've likely been dealing with exceptions in your Java programs from the very start. If your program has ever crashed and produced a stack trace, you've experienced the result of an unhandled exception occurring in your program. So why have your instructors avoided explaining how exceptions work and how to avoid crashes from the very beginning? Well, it turns out that familiarity with inheritance and polymorphism are necessary to really understand what exceptions are and why exception handling works the way it does. Assuming you're familiar with those concepts, you can now learn the rest of the story. Exceptions are objects like any other. They're defined in classes and they have properties and methods. Each exception represents some exceptional situation that's come up in the program that prevents it from continuing in the standard flow of control. All exceptions belong to a hierarchy of classes with the exception class at the root. What makes them special is that they're all descendants of another class called throwable, and they can be thrown, which breaks a program out of the standard flow of control and puts it into the exception handling flow. So what is the standard flow of control? When you launch a new program, the program begins in the main method of the driver class. The runtime environment executes statements in consecutive order until it reaches the last line of main and the program exits. Between the beginning and end of main, though, the flow may branch, it may loop, it may move to methods and other objects, but statements are still executed in sequential order, working toward completion and exiting at the end of main. In this example, main executes statement 1 followed by statement 2. When it reaches the call to method 1, main has to wait for method 1 to return before it can continue with its own statements. The flow passes to method 1 in other class. As in main, the statements in method 1 will be executed in order until there are no more statements. Method 1 executes statement 4, but when it calls method 2, it has to wait for method 2 to return before it can continue. When method 2 ends and returns, control returns to method 1. Method 1 has no additional statements, so method 1 can return. When method 1 returns, main can continue, and after the last statement of main executes, the program is finished. To keep track of the flow of control as it passes between methods and objects, the runtime environment manages a structure called the call stack. Main is the first method called, so it's the first method added to the call stack. When any subsequent method is called, it's placed on top of the method that called it. When a method is finished, it's removed from the top of the call stack and control returns to the previous method at the point where it left off. Whatever method is currently on top of the call stack is the active method, and every method below is waiting for the method it called to return. When main completes its work and is removed from the call stack, the call stack is empty and the program ends. Let's look at the call stack with our previous example. When we first start the program, driver class main is the only method on the call stack. When we reach the call to method 1, we add method 1 to the top of the call stack. Main is still waiting at the bottom for the return of method 1, but control is now passed to the top method of the call stack. Method 1 is the new active method. When method 1 calls method 2, Method 2 is added to the top of the call stack. Method 1 is waiting for method 2. Main is waiting for method 1. When method 2 completes, it's removed from the top of the call stack and control returns back to method 1 where it left off. When method 1 completes, it's removed from the top of the call stack and control returns to main. Once main is completed, it will also be removed from the call stack and that's the end of the program. Assuming nothing bad happens during the program, the program stays in its standard flow of control from start to finish. However, sometimes an exceptional situation comes up during execution and the program can't continue in the standard flow of control. When that happens, an exception object representing the problem and the program state is created and thrown. Examples of exceptional situations include null pointer exceptions, where the program tries to follow an object reference that doesn't point to an object. An arithmetic exception may occur when attempting an invalid operation, like dividing by zero. Trying to access an invalid index position in an array or a string will result in some kind of index out of bounds exception. File not found exception might occur if the program can't find or open a specified file. These are just a few examples, and I chose them because you're likely to have encountered some or all of them. 
So exception objects are created and thrown when an exceptional situation is recognized. The moment the exception is thrown, the Java runtime environment breaks out of the standard flow of control and enters the exception flow. Your code at that point has the opportunity to deal with the exception in one of three ways. The first option is the one you're familiar with already, do nothing. You're also familiar with the result of doing nothing. The program will crash and a stack trace, which is a view of the call stack at the time the exception was thrown, gets written to standard output, which is usually the console. For most runtime exceptions, this ends up being the best choice. Before we move on, it's very important that we talk about the value of the stack trace output. This is valuable information for debugging and figuring out what went wrong. It includes the type of the thrown exception, any message that was passed into the exceptions constructor, which possibly has important details about why the exception was thrown. And it has the call stack, which shows the line number for the current statement in every method that was active when the exception occurred. Again, this is valuable information for debugging and figuring out what went wrong, so don't ignore it, use it. The second option is to catch and handle the exception as soon as possible. Sometimes the bad thing that happened isn't so bad that your program can't recover. Handling an exception will involve using try-catch blocks, where the risky code that could result in a thrown exception is placed in a try block followed by one or more catch blocks, each of which is also called an exception handler. After all of the exception handlers, you can optionally include a finally block that is guaranteed to execute whether or not an exception gets thrown. This block is really useful for cleanup or state saving operations you absolutely don't want missed. The good news is when you catch and handle an exception, that handled exception will not crash the program. After an exception is caught, the runtime environment can resume the standard flow of control with the next statement following all exception handlers. Here's an example where we're trying to open a text file in a scanner and read an integer from it. A couple of things could go wrong here. If the file doesn't exist or we don't have permission to read it, the scanner could throw a file not found exception. If we succeed in opening the file, we still run the risk that the first token in the file isn't a valid integer and we could get an input mismatch exception. So the statements that could result in exceptions are placed in a try block. Notice there's one other statement also in the try block. This statement isn't expected to throw any exceptions, but it references a variable that would only have a valid value if we succeeded in opening the file and reading an int. So code that depends on getting past the dangerous code also belongs in the same try block. After the try block, we have catch blocks or exception handlers for the expected exceptions, and after the handlers is a finally block to guarantee that no matter what, we don't leave a file open in a scanner. Catch blocks are similar in structure to a method call. They specify an exception data type and a variable name like a method parameter. Inside the handler, you can refer to the caught exception by that object reference. In this example, the file not found exception handler calls the exceptions to string method. You don't have to do anything with the exception object once it's caught though. The input mismatch exception handler doesn't use the exception object in the code. Catching it was all that was necessary to handle it the program won't crash as a result of this exception. Here's where polymorphism comes into play. A thrown exception is compared to each of the listed catch types in order until a compatible assignment can be made. The exact type of the exception may not be present, but if an ancestor of the exception is found, it will match. For this reason, it's important that exception handlers are in order from most specific to least specific. A handler for the root exception class would match any descendant type, so you'd never get past that handler to a more specific one. Typically, if you want to make sure any exception would be caught and handled in some default way, you would end your list of catch blocks with one that uses the root exception type. This example is a variation on the previous one, but instead of having a handler for the file not found exception, I have a general handler for all exceptions that follows the specific handler for input mismatch exception. Any exception, including file not found exception that doesn't match the first handler, would be caught by the second handler. This is a partial view of the exception's hierarchy. At the root of the hierarchy is the exception class. All other exceptions are descendants of this class, getting more specific about exactly what kind of exceptional circumstance they re represent. As descendants of exception, all exceptions share inherited functionality, like the ability to be thrown and caught, to specify a message detailing what went wrong and to report the state of the call stack at the time the exception occurred. 
This is a good time to point out that there are two major groupings of exceptions in the hierarchy, runtime exception and its descendants, and all other descendants of exception not under runtime exception. Runtime exception and its descendants are what we call unchecked exceptions. The compiler isn't going to warn you that they might happen, because if they do, it's a result of something wrong with your program that should be fixed. We don't want to handle those kind of exceptions. When they occur, your program should crash, and you should fix the, co the code that caused it to be thrown. Exception itself, and all of its non-runtime descendants, on the other hand, are called checked exceptions. The compiler will warn you when you have a potential checked exception to be aware of, so you can prepare for it. They typically represent events that you know in advance are a possibility, but if they occur, it isn't the program's fault. For example, a program may prompt the user for the name of a file to open and read. The user may incorrectly enter the file name, and when the program attempts to open that file, it fails. The program worked correctly, but it couldn't do what it was asked to do. Because checked exceptions represent events that would be the result of something outside of the program's control, the compiler will require that they're acknowledged. Your code has to handle checked exceptions or explicitly state that it isn't going to handle it. While we're here, we should also note that there is another kind of throwable class, errors. Exceptions typically represent bad things that happen, but errors represent very, very bad things from which there is no coming back, like memory failure or some component of the runtime environment is discovered missing. Exceptions may or may not be bad enough to warrant ending your program, but they don't indicate something catastrophically wrong with the computer itself or the runtime environment's ability to run programs correctly. Now that you've seen some of the exceptions hierarchy, you can appreciate that the ordering of your handlers will be important to ensure you catch the specific exceptions you want to catch where you want to catch them. The third handling option is to propagate the exception to another method deeper in the call stack for handling. In essence, by moving deeper into the call stack, you're backing up the program to an earlier state before you deal with the exception. This can be a good option if you have, say, a sequence of related method calls that make up a larger process. If anything goes wrong during one of the steps, you'd want to start over at the beginning of the whole process. So propagation passes the exception through the call stack until it's caught. The first method with a chance to handle the exception, of course, is the one on top of the call stack. If the current statement is not inside a try block or there's no catch compatible with the thrown exception, the method is removed from the call stack and the exception propagates to the next method, which is now on top of the call stack. Propagation continues until the current statement of the top method is in a try block with a corresponding catch compatible with that thrown exception. If no method has a catch matching the thrown exception, propagation will eventually reach main. And if main doesn't catch the exception, the program will crash and print a, track, a stack trace. So really, that do-nothing option at the beginning was simply a result of propagation that ran out of methods in the call stack. Keep in mind, for checked exceptions, every method through which the exception will be propagated has to explicitly acknowledge that it's not going to handle the exception, and we do that with a throws clause in the method header. In this example, the main method has called the readVals method and passed in a file name no such file, so that doesn't exist. readVals read is now on top of the call stack, and its first statement is to try to open a scanner with the file with the bogus file name. It's going to fail and throw a file not found exception. File not found exception is a checked exception, so the readVals method does not have any try or catch blocks in it. It's not going to handle the exception, so it has to explicitly acknowledge that by adding the throws file not found exception clause to its method header. So readVals doesn't handle the file not found exception. It is removed from the top of the call stack, and the file not found exception is propagated back to the next method in the call stack. That's main. So we're back at the readVals method call inside main. And we find that the readVals method call was inside a try block, and it has a catch that matches file not found exception. So main will catch the file not found exception, print out the string value of that exception, and it will be able to continue on without crashing. Up to now, all or most exceptions you've ever encountered were defined in standard Java libraries and were thrown somewhere in standard Java library code. There may be times, however, when you're working on a program and need some kind of exception that isn't already defined somewhere in a standard library. 
you can always create your own custom exception class that represents the specific exceptional situation you need by extending the most appropriate parent class from the exceptions hierarchy. As an example, I often want to represent a situation when my program expects a very specific format for values in, say, a plain text input file, but the user specifies a file that isn't in the right format. I want an invalid file format exception, but there isn't anything quite like that, or at least I haven't found it, in the standard API. It logically falls into the I.O. exception category because it's an issue that comes up during an I.O. process, and it makes sense that it should be a checked exception because I can easily anticipate that it's likely to happen, but I wouldn't, it wouldn't be my program's fault if it did happen. I also know that recovering my program is as simple as reporting to the user that the specified file doesn't work and I can reprompt them for a good input file. So I can create a new class, invalid file format exception, extending IO exception. In my program, if I recognize something wrong with an input file while I'm parsing it, I can throw a new object of type invalid file format exception. My program then can handle it, propagate it, or ignore it just like any other exception. And it could be caught as an invalid file format exception, an IO exception, or a regular exception, because those classes are all its ancestors. Notice the only thing that I need inside this new class is a constructor that matches the new file type, or the new class type. And every exception expects a string that is the specific message that goes along with that exception. All I need to do with that string is pass it through to its parent. So I have inside my constructor a super constructor call that takes in that same message. This is all that's needed to write a new exception class. Throwing an exception, whether it's from a standard library or a custom exception, uses the throw keyword and an object of that exception type. In these examples, I'm throwing the references returned from exception class constructor calls. The first one creates a generic exception and throws it. The second example throws one of my custom invalid file format exceptions if the scanner doesn't find the int it expected. Exceptions may seem intimidating and magical until you understand them, but they're objects like any other. Learning to use exceptions will allow you to write robust programs that recover from non-fatal situations and keep users and yourself happy. As a last word though, don't use exceptions and exception handling as a substitute for basic condition checks. Exceptions really should be reserved for situations that are exceptional, not expected to happen frequently. So welcome to the world of exception handling. Thanks for watching.